Good morning, Eden. It is so good to be with you again. Thanks for joining us. Um, if you're new here, my name is Josh Duthers. This is Josh Carney. We're both pastors and chaplains, and uh, we are passionate about helping people see the world God's way. Hence why our, uh, our podcast, Good Morning Eden, we are waking up to God's way of seeing the world, just like we were in the Garden of Eden. And we're doing that by going through the Gospel of Mark. Um, and we're, we're really getting through this thing. We're getting to the end, um, literally and spiritually the end. Yeah, yeah. Okay, anyway, sorry, it was a bit of a... <laughs> Nerdy pun. Uh, but episode 21, today we're talking about Mark chapter 13. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to hand it over to Josh to do our scripture reading today. Yep, no worries. Mark chapter 13, we're doing the whole thing because it's um, one, one big conversation that Jesus is having with some people, his disciples in particular. So I'm reading in the NIV. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, Jesus replied? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, "Tell us when will these things happen, and what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled?" And Jesus said to them, "Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claim, claiming I am He, and will deceive many." When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and are brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at that time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother and father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea Flee to the mountains. Let let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloaks. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter, because those will be the days of distress, unequal from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut those days short, no one would survive. But for your sake, the elect, whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. And at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, will the Son of Man come? At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs got tender and its leaves came out, you know that the summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. About, uh, but about the day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servant in charge, each assigned to their task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you don't know when the owner of the house will come back whether in the evening or midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Such an ominous final word for a chapter. I know, hey. Watch. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah, massive uh, massive chapter Mm. um, today. Um, And I believe they call it the Olivet Discourse. Yeah. Yes. I don't know if it was like Olivet or Olivet, <laughs> but um, yeah, pretty pretty interesting stuff. Um, a lot of people have 
read and speculated around this chapter with a lot of things. Um, and I guess today we're going to share some of our reflections. And um, you know what? There's a lot that could be said about this passage and mm. we can't say all of it. <laughs> yeah, We just don't have the time, um, you know, or the capacity really to just go into every single like aspect of this. Um, but I guess we just want to share some reflection on, the, on this passage, um, what we've learned from it. Um, so, yeah. Um, do you want to... Do you want to start us off, Josh? Sure. Sure yeah. thing. So I just wanted to kind of give a macro look at, at this passage for a second. So Mark chapter 13, it kind of is the end of Jesus' discourse and discussions and encounters within the temple. Mm-hmm. And so it's real fitting that Jesus is kind of predicting what essentially is the destruction of the temple, which occurs in um, 70 AD, a, a few, maybe around 30 to, to 40 years after Jesus is having this conversation here. And so... The way that Big Laz, Larry Hurtado, has structured the passage is one that I find most compelling. Mm -hmm. And so he basically structures Mark 13 into the following ways. Verses 1 to 4 is just a general introduction to the idea of the destruction of the temple. And everything in this passage is hanging on the destruction of the temple, what Jesus is talking about. Mm -hmm. And so you get verses... Uh, verses 5 to 13, which is talking about general troubles that the disciples will experience. And we'll, get, and we'll get into that. Then we get more specifically the abomination that causes desolation and the things around that from verses 14 to 23. From verses 24 to 27, it's one of the only times in this passage where Jesus is actually talking about his second coming and mm. what it means for, for his return. Then from verse 28 to 31, he goes back to talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And then he finishes off from verse 32 to verse 37 about just general preparedness. And so that is kind of, you know, when when we're thinking about this passage and why Mark chose to include this passage, the point of Mark including this passage from the get-go, I think, is important to say Mm. that Jesus is not giving anyone a detailed timeline about what it looks like when Jesus returns again. Yeah. That is the whole. That is actually the opposite of the point that <laughs> that Mark is trying to make. Because yeah. all throughout this passage, he's saying, "Don't be deceived. Watch out. No one knows the hour. So anyone that tries to kind of put the pieces together of this passage into a timeline of right, Jesus is going to come back at this date or this time, wrong. Straight, straight up wrong, and and not not." Mark's yes. primary purpose at all. We come from a Christian tradition that learned that lesson the hard way. In, <laughs> in 1844, yeah. we call it the great disappointment. We're like, yep. it's when people tried to set a date and realize you can't set a date on this. Yep. Um, so, yes, we are keenly aware <laughs> of the, even though we weren't there, like our tradition, uh, Seventh day Adventist Church was born out of something from that, and we've learned a lot and grown a lot from it. Yep. 100%. Yeah. So we'll, we'll just dive into each kind of section. So verses 1 to, to 4 are really just straightforward. You know, they're leaving the temple, and the temple is one of the ancient wonders of the world. Mm. It, had, it had stones that were bigger than some of the pyramids, stones that were used to build their pyramids. Um, this, this thing was, was beautiful. Yeah. And I've got a quote from Josephus. Give it. About it. Yeah. So Josephus, who was an ancient historian... He described the temple, um, and I really like the way he describes it. He says, now the outward face of the temple in its front wanted nothing that was likely, sorry, now the outward face of the temple in its front wanted nothing that was likely to surprise either man's mind or their eyes, for it was covered all over with plates of gold of great weight. And at the first rising of the sun reflected back a very fiery splendor and made those who force themselves to look up upon it to turn their eyes away just as they would um, have done at the sun's own rays. But this temple appeared to strangers when they were at a distance like a mountain covered with snow. For as to those parts of it that were not um, glit, gilt, sorry, gilt, (laughs) Um, they were exceedingly white. Of its stones, some of them were 45 cubits in length and five in height and six in breadth. So um, for those wondering, a cubit... Um, the way they would measure a cubit. If you're watching the video, this will be easier to explain, but it is the length from your elbow to the to the tips of your fingers is a cubit. It's around 50 centimetres. Yeah. Um, so the other measurement they would use is a hand breadth, so the width of your hand. And if your body is in proportion, you'd have six hand breadths and that would make up one cubit. 
Yeah, wow. And so, yeah. Um, so obviously, it's not a very precise measurement because everybody <laughs> has different length arms. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a great thing we eventually went to meters. Yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is a more... But yeah, that's how they would measure things. So 50 cubits, if you just get your arm and imagine... And 25 meters. Yeah. Wow. Imagine 50 of them or whatever it yeah. is. Um, yeah, that's... That's a big stone. That's a big stone. Yeah, that's huge. So And Jesus says... It's all coming down. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't it be like crazy to look at like that description and yeah. imagine that thing like coming down? Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. yeah. And so Jesus says that very thing. Hey, not one stone will be left on one, and one another. Everything will be thrown down. Mm. And so they left this and went to the Mount of Olives, hence why it's called the Olivet Discourse. Mm-hmm. And Peter, James, John and Andrew, the boys, they come up <laughs> and they ask Jesus, hey, when... <laughs> the, <laughs> the boys, the yeah. boys. Okay. <laughs> they, they ask Jesus, you know, when, when are these things going to happen? So when, when is the destruction of the temple going to occur? Mm. And so Jesus goes about answering the question by not answering their question. Um, classic Jesus. Classic Jesus. Mm. And we get into it in verses 5 to 13. So in verses 5 to 13, Jesus starts by saying, hey, watch out that no one deceives you. And so Jesus says this idea of, of watching out and watching for deception many times and not being alarmed many times throughout this whole passage, but specifically in, in this kind of discourse between verses 5 to, to 13. And so he says, many are going to come in, in Jesus' name saying... Like many, many will come saying, I'm the Messiah. You're going to hear of wars, rumors of wars. You're, you're going to see nations rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. You're going to see natural disasters and famines. But these are the only, these are the beginning of birth pains. And then he goes on to say, you know, you're going to be handed over to local synagogues. You're going to be flogged. You're going to stand up and try to give an explanation of your faith and, and all these things. Mm. But it, for me, it all hangs on this idea that these are the beginning of birth pains. Yep. And so the, the scholars that I was reading about this you know, sometimes we read this idea of, all right, so this must mean it's like the beginning of the end, so the end is going to come soon. Mm. But the scholars that I was reading were kind of saying the idea of when, when the first birth pain comes, so when the first birth pain comes when a woman is in labour, yes, like it, it's, it's in a way be- beginning of the process of something happening, mm. but we don't know when that process will occur. Yeah. You don't know whether the, the baby's going to come on the second birth pain, the third, the fourth, the 50th, the 100th. You just don't know. Mm. And so basically what Jesus is essentially trying to say in verses 13 to uh, in verses 5 to 13, he's basically saying, hey, there are, there's, there's going to be wars, there's going to be famines, there's going to be natural disasters, there's going to be all these things, but just don't let these things deceive you mm. because this is just business as usual in the reality of a broken world. Yep. Because the reality is there's never been a time where there hasn't been war. There's never been a time where there hasn't been famine, earthquakes, natural disasters, people coming and claiming that they're Messiah-type figures in any culture or in any you know, period in history. Mm. And so Jesus is saying, when you see these things happen in your life, hey, don't be deceived by them. You know, this is just business as usual mm. in, in a broken world. And don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. These, these, the end is still to come. Yep. You know, when you see these things. And I think that's really important, especially in, you know, our church context being Seventh-day Adventists, because mm. I think we love to see a war or we love to see a natural disaster. We love to see what the Pope is doing. <laughs> and then we try to yeah. just slot it into Bible prophecy or slot it in, in, you know, some way, shape or form to say, hey, look, Jesus is coming back soon. I'm not saying that Jesus isn't coming back soon. I'm saying what Jesus is saying at the end of this chapter. No one knows when he's coming back soon. Yeah. And so let's not be deceived into thinking that we can fear people into saying Jesus is coming back. So yeah. that is kind of the point of verses 3 to, to 13. Um, yeah, the, way, the way I see it is when we see these signs, they're not meant to make us freak out about like, it's the end, you know. It's actually meant to make us recognise again our need for a saviour yep. and our need for our saviour's return. Wow. Um, that's and that's because that. all of these things are, re, are a result of our, you know, sinful nature, are a result mm. of our brokenness after Eden. You know, that's what these things are. And so when we see these things, it's a reminder that like, oh, the world is in pain and yep. we are waiting for that arrival of Jesus again. 100%. Mm. I love that thought. Thank you for sharing that. Whenever we see a natural disaster or a war or anything, it's just a reminder that, hey, we need him. We need him. Oh, 
that's yeah. so good. That's my take. I've already got my takeaway. <laughs> Thank you. Thank no you. Worries. And so, um, yeah, when well, we see those things, yeah. we do watch them because we're praying. We're like, oh, Jesus, please come, come soon. Let's fix this. <laughs> come fix this yeah. right now, Lord. We are hurting. The, yeah. the hope in this passage is that despite the natural disasters and the wars, the rumors of wars, whatever, Jesus is saying the gospel is going to be preached. Yeah. And, you know, despite all this happening, the gospel will triumph. And when we as Christians are faced with times when we have to stand up and give an account for our faith, mm. the, promise that, the promise that Jesus gives is that the Holy Spirit will be with us. Yeah. And this is actually the first time in, Math, in all of Mark that Jesus promises the Holy Spirit with his, his followers. Oh, um, right. yeah. yeah, which is interesting because it's, it's, the Holy Spirit is with people when, in a sense, they need it the most. Mm. And that's, that's, just, that's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so Jesus kind of finishes off this sentence um, and this, this kind of part of the passage by saying, everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Mm. It's just another kind of reminder that Jesus isn't giving an end date, but you know, he's more concerned with the, the quality of our character as opposed to our ability to write a date in our calendar. And um, yeah, I think that's just a really important thing that Jesus uses to finish off this, seg- this segment but um, did yeah. you have anything before I power through to the next section? Oh, yeah. Well, I guess, like, to me, I, I hear that last part um, about holding fast. And to me, I see a big connection between that and Revelation fourteen twelve, 12, mm. um, which says, here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus, like holding to Jesus and enduring. Yeah. You know, that's just so, that seems to be like all the way to the end is mm. something about that. Almost like a resilience of the faith, uh, a res- yep. resilience of the saints, like we're, we're holding on, um, yeah, like not just by thread, but holding on to like everything he's taught us and our mm. faith in him, like still having your whole life surrendered to him, no matter what sort of turmoil the world yep. goes through. Um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's what I've got. Um, I mean, I always think about like when it talks about the gospel must be preached to all nations, like, I'm a, I, I don't know, maybe I'm too logistical, but I'm like, how like <laughs> hasn't that already like happened you know i don't know but maybe maybe not. i don't know but anyway um it's it's one of those things i guess we just we keep going we keep preaching to all because mm. um there was a wait there was a quote that i had about this somewhere let me just find it for oh yeah yeah um the great call so the great it's kind of like the great commission mm. um where is it oh yeah this is from john dibdahl in the andrew study bible notes um, so the reason it's important that the gospel needs to be like given to the whole world, um, it's a worldwide proclamation is a clear sign of the coming of the Lord. I was about to concur. All humanity will be given an opportunity to respond to Christ. Um, it's only then can this like cosmic conflict really, well, he says it's only then where the cosmic conflict can come to an end. Now, it's like that idea that it's like the reason that this needs to go to everybody is because Jesus wants everybody to have a chance to respond, mm. you know. Um, and I think some people take this, I don't know. I've heard some people, okay, I don't, I don't know if this is getting a little bit sidetracked, but I've, I've, I've heard people talk about like, hey, we need to go and take the gospel to the whole world so that we can make Jesus come back faster. Mm. And in my head I'm always like, I don't know if that's the... I don't know if that's a good, like, rec- yes, it's awesome for Jesus to come back faster, but I feel like the reason we take the gospel to the whole world isn't so that we can go to heaven faster, isn't so that we can tick a box. Mm. It's be- we do it out of a, um, out of gratitude for what he's done for us, that we want everybody to experience this and his love and compassion. Yeah. Um, so that makes sense. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Um, so I think some people... Yeah, I don't like. I know Jesus is saying that it, the gospel needs to go to the old nations before he comes back, um, but I don't know if it's you use that as like we've got to race through this. Like I feel like yeah. it's. I mean, yeah, we do want to race through it. I don't know. Like maybe I'm a bit torn around this, but I'm like, yeah, I do want to, but I want to do it out of love, and I want people to experience yeah. him, not so that I can get to heaven faster, but so that they can respond to this love and grace as well. Yeah, yeah, no, anyway. it's a beautiful. Thought. Anyway, that's, that's all I've got. All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Race through. Yeah. Sermon <laughs> over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks um, for listening to my TED talk. All right. No. <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, we will we'll move on to the next segment now, which is from verses 14 to 23, because Jesus kind of now addresses the initial question of when is the destruction going to happen? And he brings up this idea of the abomination that causes desolation. So this is a really interesting side note. 
Mm-hmm. Super, super interesting because the abomination that causes desolation, uh, in whatever your translation, it could be the desolating sacrilege, the um, yeah, the abomination that causes desolation. Yeah, it's a few, few different translations have a few different things. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a quotation taken directly or a concept taken directly from Daniel. Um, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 11, Daniel chapter 12. And it describes great hardship and troubles for Israel, including a final assault upon its religion as part of the end time trials before God's deliverance in the mm. book of Daniel. And so what's interesting is that during the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament was written, was called the intertestamental period. And so in the intertestamental period, there's a rich history of things that happened um, in the nation of Israel and it wasn't all good because they got released towards the end of the Torah, but towards the end of the Old Testament out of the captivity from the Medo Persians. And they went back and established their temple again and, you know, tried to build their lives up. But they continued to kind of fall into some practices that they shouldn't have done. And mm. kings from other countries invaded them. And one king was the king of Seleucid, Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And so. Yeah, he was a. The Seleucids were kind of like the Greeks. The Greeks came and invaded Israel, and so he did something pretty, pretty wild and sacrilegious. He, in one six seven, so one hundred and sixty seven BCE, came into the Jewish temple, and he erected a statue to himself within the temple, and he sacrificed to Zeus on the altar of the temple too, which is pretty, pretty, pretty wild. He sacrificed a pig, didn't he? He sacrificed a pig, yeah, which is unclean yeah. in Jewish context. So mad disrespect. So disrespectful. So disrespectful. <laughs> yeah. And so he also did some other things and he um, put some decrees about the Sabbath and other festivals that caused them to profane the Jewish stuff, um, abolish circumcision and just, yeah, continue to sacrifice unclean animals in the temple. And it was a super low point in Jewish history. Mm. And there was a family called the Maccabees that did something about it, which is great. But the idea behind it is that many commentators like Josephus refer to this event as the the abomination that causes desolation, Mm. as this thing that was just so radical that it just changed so much for, for Israel. Yeah. And what's super interesting is that when Jesus refers to this in verse 14... He kind of implies that this abomination that causes de- desolation, this this temple defiling, hasn't occurred yet, hmm. and it's almost like Antiochus Epiphanes thing was kind of a foreshadowing of what was to come. Hmm. And so we also know this because in parentheses, Mark is saying, "Hey guys, readers, understand this or like pay attention to this," because he's wanting the original readers of of Mark's um, letter to kind of just pick up and say, "Hey." Look, look out for this event that's going to, to come. Yeah, okay. And so what I am strongly led to believe based on, you know, many scholars that I've read in, in this passage is that Jesus is referring here to the destruction of Jerusalem, which occurred over the events of 66 to 70 AD. Hmm. So in 66 to 70 AD was the, the great Jewish revolution and it was a major Jewish uprising um, of the Jews in, in Jerusalem and the Judean region against the, the Roman Empire. And this revolution, it was fueled by religious, economic and political tensions between the Jews and the the Roman um, authorities. And so, you know, in 66 AD, that's when the outbreak and the revolution began. The tensions boiled up and it particularly boiled up under a man, uh, under a corrupt governor, Roman governor called Gessius Florus. And he he seized temple funds and violently suppressed protests in, in a really negative way in Judea, and the Jewish people were like, nah, th- that's it, we're done here. And so they rebelled and took control of Jerusalem and kind of just, they kind of won a battle, like a significant battle. The Jews kind of reclaimed their, their city. And so the Roman, the Roman governor of Syria, Cessius Gallius, he, he attempted to rep- repress this um, revolt, and lots of people died. Big idea, lots of people died especially in the temple, priests were killed in, wow. in the temple. And so when I see Jesus talking about the abomination that causes desolation, I see that this kind of event happening in 66 AD is kind of that beginning of the abomination that causes desolation. Mm. Because Jesus is saying, hey, in verse 14 of, of Mark, he's saying, when you see this, run. Okay, when you see this, run. Like flee to the mountains, 
don't worry about going inside and getting stuff. Just get out of there. Let no one go into the field to get their cloak. Man, if you're pregnant, so unlucky for you because it will be harder <laughs> to run away. Which is, yeah, hey, yeah, uh, my yeah. wife's pregnant. Both of our wives are pregnant. Yeah, yeah. Seeing them waddle around <laughs> takes, a, takes a minute. Yeah, it takes a minute. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's like, hey, hope, like Jesus is saying, hopefully this doesn't take place in the winter for you because it's going to be rough to kind of escape this in winter. Yeah. Um, and he kind of goes into hyperbolic language in verse 19 saying, you know, there will be a time of distress unequal from the beginning of the world. Mm. And so we know from Jewish, uh, we know from history that when this event in 66 AD kind of broke out that, you know, this Jewish revolt happened, many Christians actually saw these signs and did what Jesus said. They, they ran, they fleed the city, mm. they didn't stay. And because of that, there's not actually many Christians that were killed during this Jewish revolt because wow. they listened to the words of Jesus. And so this kind of, this, this event, uh, well, this, this revolt took place over a, a few years and it reached its head in 70 AD because that is when the, the, the Roman government laid siege over Jerusalem and after a couple of months, I think, I think it was a couple of months, but after a period of time, that is when the, the forces of Rome came in and they did what Jesus said they would do. They kind of destroyed the, the temple and let no stone allowed to be on, on the other. And then they continued to defile the place by erecting like shrines and stuff to, to, to the emperor. Yeah, wow. Well. So it's a pretty, pretty hectic history. Mm. Um, and I think in verses 14 to, to 23, that is what Jesus is referring to what's happening. So mm. in, in the first part of the passage, he's saying, hey guys, wars, rumors of wars, you know, famines, that's all part of everyday life. But guys, one day you're gonna see something crazy. The temple's gonna be defiled. Mm. That's your cue to get out of there. Mm. That's your cue to get out. Of there. That's that's the one thing that you're like, get get out because there's going to be something bad. Yeah. And within a few years of that sign happening, it was bad and the temple was destroyed. And so when you look in verses 20 to 23, Jesus is saying, you know, like if if God hadn't actually intervened at the end of this, man, then everyone would have died. Yeah. You know? Like then that's pretty that's pretty wild. Hmm. And he's then, he then goes on to say, hey, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is a Messiah, or look, there he is, don't believe him, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and deceive many, even the elect, so be on guard, I've told you everything ahead of time. What Jesus is basically saying is that during this time of, of war and ruin, there are going to be people or groups of people that rise up and saying, guys, I will lead us through this time of difficulty. Hmm. I will save us from the Romans, you know, Trust me, I I think I can lead us through this. And Jesus is saying, just don't believe them because mm. they're not gonna they're not gonna be able to do that for you. Um, and they they're gonna they're gonna do stuff that makes it seem like they have promise. You know, win win a battle here and there. You know, say an inspiring speech here and there. But just don't be deceived because there's no point in in listening to them. Mm. And so and we and from history we know you know that there were those messianic figures that were rising up and, and saying, hey, follow me, or, you know, you had the zealots that were really in charge of the, or really kind of, not were in charge, they were the, the pioneers of the, the revolt because they were like, guys, we can do this, like we can overcome, we can mm. overcome the, the Romans. And so basically Jesus in this, in this passage is saying, the destruction of the Jerusalem, it's going to happen. It is what it is. So mm. don't be deceived by people that, that make it seem like they can save you from that or protect you from that. You just got to run. Yeah. You just got to run. So. Wow. It's incredible. Yeah. Like, it's like saved so many lives. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 100%. And it potentially saved the gospel. You know what I mean? Like, yep. if all the Christians died, like, how would the story of Jesus gotten out, you know? Yeah. Mm. Okay. So did you have anything that you wanted to add? I'm good. This is great. This is great. Yeah, <laughs> I'm having a good time. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> so we get we get then to verse 24 to 27, and so this is actually the pivot point to where Jesus now talks about his return, and so he says, "But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And at that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory." And he will send his angels to gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. So this is a super interesting, super interesting passage. I got a few quotes that I wanted to read just to kind of explain why Jesus chose this um, Old Testament passage to refer to, which is from, found in Isaiah. Yep, yep. And so, yeah, what, what, what did Big Lad say? He says, yeah, so there's... 
from verse 23 to verse 24, um, there's, a, there's a transition. Mm-hmm. So basically, Jesus is saying the, the preceding events of verses 5 to 23 are all the result of the evil in the world and will involve suffering from God's people. But now Jesus is going to talk about his direct manifestation and the vindication and salvation of the world. And so we're not sure, like the point, some people, some people look at verse 24 and say, oh, okay, so as soon as these things happen, then Jesus is going to come back. Hmm. But the point of verse 24 is there's no chronological marker as to when this will happen. Hmm. It, he's just, Jesus is saying, this is going to happen. And after all of this stuff happens, one day, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light, the stars and, and, and so on and so forth. So that's point number one I want to make um, here. And I think I have a quote from Big Laz. Um, he says, Beyond the dark days ahead of them, the disciples are to see the shining appearance of the Son of Man in glory, triumphant with his followers, though they are not told how far beyond chronologically. So that's just a really interesting point to, yeah. to make. And so verse 24 to verse 27 is constructed heavily from Old Testament language. And I just got a bit of a, an extended quote about what the purpose of this idea that the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken is all about. And so Big Laz says, verses 24 to 27 are constructed out of vocabulary heavenly dependent upon a variety of Old Testament passages. The traditional nature of the language must be recognised for the description of these events is not intended as specific and literal indication of their appearance. Rather, these allusions to the Old Testament indicate the meaning of events. The cosmic disturbances described in verses 24 and 25 resemble Old Testament descriptions of manifestations of God's judgment in Israel's history. The language originated in ancient Israelite times when the sun, moon, and stars were believed to represent deities who controlled world affairs. Israel believed that when God acted, these celestial bodies would be disturbed. Those powers that other nations believed controlled history would be shown up as helpless under God's power. Mm. Of course, in Mark's time, uh, of course, in Mark's time, belief in the power of celestial bodies was still strong, and the meanings of the statements would have not been lost on his readers. Mm. So the big idea that Larry is saying here is that the reason why Jesus refers to Isaiah isn't because literally the sun will be darkened and there'll be no moon and the stars will literally fall from the sky. He's saying that. The, the spiritual powers of the world are going to go into to chaos. You know, yep. something's going to turn it upside down. Yep. And that is when you will see the Son of Man coming. Because mm. when the Son of Man comes on the cloud, that is when everything is going to be made right in this world again. Yep. And the wrongs will be turned upside down to rights again. Mm. And that's when the powers of darkness are going to have no ability to do anything on this world anymore. That's why the sun's going to be dark. That's why the moon and yeah. the sun stars will fall away. Yeah, they're going into panic mode. They're going into like panic the mode. The true ruler is back. He's and back. These like fake rulers are like, oh yep. no, like, yep. it's over for Or these us. corrupt rulers. Yeah, yeah true. These, these yeah. corrupt rulers. Because they're real. They're very real in the sense of yes. they have power. Yeah. But I mean like fake, fake as in like they're pretending to be the rulers of this yep. earth but they're not yep. truly the actual rulers of this yeah. earth. Like that belongs to like God, yep. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And so... You know, for the Israelites saw this as the sun, the sun, moon, and stars as um, being representing celestial bodies. If we use the language of Paul, that's he's talking about the powers and the principalities. Mm-hmm. That's in Ephesians chapter six, verse twelve. And so, yeah, basically, Jesus is saying, when he comes again on the clouds, all of these things are going to be disturbed because he's going to make things right again. Wow. And this idea that Jesus, the Son of Man, firstly, Son of Man, just draw back to Daniel chapter 7 where the Son of Man is coming on a cloud there as well. So Jesus is drawing on that imagery. And he says that he's coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And, you know, the com- all the commentators that I was reading were basically highlighting the idea that in the Old Testament, whenever you saw a cloud, it was a manifestation of the glory of God. Wow. So you had a cloud leading the people of Israel in the... Israel in, in the desert hmm. during the day, protecting them from the, the harsh sun. There was a cloud that descended on Mount Sinai when Moses received the Ten Commandments. There was a cloud when God descended on the temple and the tabernacle. And so this hmm. imagery of a cloud isn't necessarily like Jesus is riding a, a cumulonimbus in the sky, <laughs> which is my, the biggest type of cloud. That's the only thing I remember from grade six geography. <laughs> that was such a like a random... <laughs> 
it? What's it called? Cumulonimbus. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's the biggest. It's the biggest type of cloud, and I just remember it because I'm like, that's a big cloud. Anyway, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus isn't riding. Like Dragon Ball Z, like a Nimbus. <laughs> yeah, 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 that little yellow cloud. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's one that I understand. That's, okay, yeah, that's yeah, one. Yeah, cool. Jesus is actually, when he's arriving, he's bringing the presence of God back to this earth again. Mm. And that is the idea of why Jesus is coming in the cloud. He's coming in with that glory that was experienced partially in the temple, that was experienced partially by the, the people of Israel, but now the whole world will be able to experience that Garden of Eden intention that God wanted to be with his people again. Mm. And that's, um, that's, that's so awesome. And that's why yeah. in verse 27, Jesus says he'll gather the angels to, he'll get the angels to gather all his people from all ends of the, the earth and the heavens because he's bringing them back to himself. Mm. And so that's kind of the end of the story. Wow. Which is the end of the earth's history, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. It is. Um, Did you have anything to say before I continue to, to power through this? Um, no, I feel like I, I'm really just powering. I'm sorry. If I'm, I'm just having like, a good time, bro. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just got real deep into this and I'm like, yeah, yeah. I just really enjoyed learning about this. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. No, yeah, I'm, I think it's awesome. Um, yeah, just that image of the cloud is so beautiful. So, yeah, it is. Yeah, I don't know. I th- I'm, I'm actually happy to keep going. I've got some stuff to say on the next part. Okay, sweet. Yeah, well, yeah. We'll, get, we'll get into the next part then. Mm-hmm. Verses 28 to 31, Jesus is going back to talking about the destruction of the temple again. Yep. So he's saying, hey, guys, so learn, learn a lesson from this fig tree, especially referring back to verse 14 and the idea of the abomination yep. that causes desolation. When you see these things, the end is going to come. Mm-hmm. All right, the end of the temple is going to come. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all this have happened. And that's true because this event took place maybe 30 to 35 years after Jesus predicted this. Yeah. They say so, a generation is about 40 years. Yeah. So, so perfect. Perfect for them. So they would have been alive or some of them would have, some of them were killed, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. unfortunately, in the book of Acts. And um, yeah, Jesus just gives his promise in verse 31 that, hey, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Mm. And so that's just a real reminder that despite the circumstances that come our way, we can trust the promises of Jesus through the good, but more importantly, through the bad. Yeah. Because he predicts that life will be tough. He doesn't pretend that life isn't, but he also promises that, hey, there is hope. I'm, yep. co- I'm coming. I'm coming to, to make mm. the world right again. So, yeah. There's a lot of layers to this. So many layers. Because like even the fig tree, like he brings back the analogy of the fig tree, which mm. he had like last chapter or a couple of chapters ago, mm. which he used as an analogy about the like um, the fallen nature of the like pharisaical system, like the temple system had become corrupted. Yeah. Um, like it wasn't bearing the right fruits anymore. And so like that whole thing about Jesus cursing the fig tree, all that kind of stuff. Um, and now here... He's bringing back this whole, like, the lesson of the fig tree again, like the temple and the whole system of the temple is about to fall Mm. and be destroyed because it's not like essentially Jesus is, like, becoming the true temple, you know. Um, But then, like, that is then being expanded out to also being, like, but also, like, this world is eventually going to fall, you know, like, Mm. and I will become, like, the king of this. You know what I mean? Like, it's like... Ah, it's so many, like, layers. It's incredible that he's, like, doing all of this. Like, he's teaching... He's teaching to them about like their future, but also to all of us about Our the world's future. Yeah. All in one, like, and about like the injustice of the temple system and the injustices we see in the like rulers of this world today as well. Mm. Jesus, man. I don't Layered. know. This is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, anyway, I think um, if you want to know more about the fig tree, just go back a few episodes. I can't remember exactly. I think maybe two episodes ago. We talked about the fig tree. I believe um, so. So, yeah, you can get a deeper dive into that rather than going back through it all again today. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's what I wanted to add there. No, perfect. Cool. Well, verse 32 to verse 37 is basically the whole point of the passage that Jesus is trying to make. Yep. And he's basically saying, hey, no one knows, not even the angels or the son, but only the father knows when I'm coming back. So be on guard, be alert. You don't know when this will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house, puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you don't know when the owner of the house will come back, whether evening or midnight or when the crows are at dawn. If 
he comes suddenly, don't let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. You know, I, to summarise this end bit without going too, too heavy into it, it's basically just Jesus' way of saying, you're actually not going to know when I'm coming back. Mm. And that's the purpose of this Christian walk. You know, it's not meant for you to know the time or the date or the hour because Jesus cares more about the content of our character and, you know, a heart that is expect, expectant on him as opposed to having a date where, okay, Jesus is coming back on, you know, the 4th of May, 2029. All right, I'm just going to live my life, do whatever I want until the 3rd of mm. May. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. so, I think that if Jesus gave us a time, that's exactly how oh, so many people would live. Yeah. Um, and that would just cause so much chaos in this world because yeah. people would just be giving into debaucherous, debaucherous living and, yep. you know, just craziness. So Jesus is saying, hey, it's not a, it's the point is not to know when I'm coming back, it's to trust that I am. Mm. And so just wait expectantly and allow that to shape the way that you live your life. And that's why he uses the servant analogy of like, we all have our tasks, we all have our lot, the, the, the passions he's put on our hearts and the desires that he's put on our hearts to serve him in the ways that he's gifted us to do it. So just be faithful in your service. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if he comes back while we're living, great. If he comes back while we're dead, the promise is that he's going to raise us from the dead and give us new life Yeah, in Corinthians. So... Yeah, that's just a beautiful way to end the passage. Watch. Just watch. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, even the way, the way like, watch and, like, it's like keep watch. Like, I like yeah. 36. It's like if he's come suddenly, don't let him find you sleeping, you know? Yeah. Like, to me, it's like act like act like he could come back any moment now. Mm. Like, it's part of, like, my, my faith is, like, I believe, like, I'm not sitting there looking for signs so I can be like, oh, he's going to come back soon. Like, I'm trying to live with a heart that, like, he could come back, like, right now. Yeah. And if he comes back, like, right now, I want to be, like, doing, doing what he's called me to, mm. you know, like, as much as I can. Yeah. Um, obviously, I've still got to sleep and do it. You know, like, I've still got, like, a life to live too. But, like, um, but ultimately, I, I, want, I want to be like faithful to what he's given me yeah. um, like that you know servants put in charge of like where, where he's assigned me like I want to be faithful to that calling because like I've seen like these these wars rumors of wars whatever all this stuff and to me um, it's a reminder of my need for Jesus to come back soon um, 100% now if possible that would be great but you know like but I'm just going to live every day like he could come back the next day yeah. you know um and I think that's really that's the that's the good morning Eden moment. Yep. It's just like in the garden, Jesus was dwelling with his people all the time. Mm. Um, that's what like you know, God and Adam and Eve they they dwelt together in the garden, and so now I'm in a space where it's like I'm living I'm living in a space of like I want this to be like Eden again. I'm yeah. waiting for him to dwell with me again. Like I want to have that expectant heart. It's like living living like I'm in heaven now in a way, you know, almost. Um, that Eden mindset. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's yeah. the mindset I want to I wanna have. Yeah, we, we were in Connect Groups on church one day. Connect Groups is Sabbath school. At, we, that's what we call Sabbath school at Kellyville Church. Mm-hmm. Um, and someone asked the question, you know, oh, if you know you only had like 10, 10 hours to live or 12, one of those classic, if you knew, knew you had a certain yeah. amount of time to live, yeah. what would you do with your life? And it hit me at that moment. It wasn't, it wasn't like I had some profound philosophical idea. I think it was more from like God really mm. that if my answer to that question, what will you do if you knew you only had a day to live was anything other than nothing, like nothing different? Mm. Because, it, sorry, let me rephrase that. The, the question was what would you change about your life? Oh. Sorry, what would yeah, you change okay. about your life if you only had like 24 hours to live? And I realised that if I gave any other answer than nothing, then I have been living a subpar Christian life. Wow. Not in the sense of I'm trying to work for my salvation, mm. but if, there's, if I'm not living every day and laying my head down on the pillow and saying, man, I'm glad I loved the way that I loved and I'm glad I was grateful for the great things I was grateful for. Mm. I'm glad I was able to stand up for the things I stood up for instead of just saying, all right, maybe I'll work on that tomorrow or maybe I'll, maybe I'll try being kind to that person tomorrow mm. or maybe I'll, maybe I'll apologise later after you know, they do something for, you know, Mm. that type of thing. Like if we're not living every day like it's our last in the sense that Jesus, like you were saying, could be coming back at any moment. I Mm. think I've missed the mark with my Christianity. And that was a very confronting moment. Yeah. It was a very confronting moment for me. And so it's just something that I'm trying to pray about a little bit more in my own life, just being like, Lord, 
make me ready. Not, not in the sense of knowing the times and knowing that, but give me a heart that if you were to come back today, it, I wouldn't be making a mad scramble of repentance and yeah. of like, oh, I need to tell my family I love them. I need to, you know, do, do this, do that. It's like, no, every day I'm actually telling my family I love them. Mm. Every day I'm actually telling the people around me that I'm grateful for them. You know, every day I'm actually just enjoying my walk with Jesus so that when he comes back, it's more like a, a, fr- like a friend that I've been FaceTiming. Mm. And now it's a face to, friend that I see face to face. So, mm. yeah, very confronting for me in all the best ways. Yeah, well. I kind of was challenged by that idea that came to my brain. But, Does yeah. the person who asked you, asked you this question knew they threw you into like an existential no, crisis? they didn't. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Hopefully they listened to this and find out. Yeah, it was like, it was like a, yeah. yeah. It was just an off comment too. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. what the heck? It's amazing. <laughs> no, that's really cool. Uh, let's do some reflection questions to finish off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, where, oh, where do we start? Have you, how many have you got? I just got one. Okay, you know what? I got one too. We can okay. just do two today. That's yep. okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. I think the second coming is something that has been a concept that has made a lot of people fearful. Mm. And especially when, especially in the Adventist context where we, we surround it with so much trial and calamity and just like things that you don't want to be a part of. <laughs> like I don't want to be murdered or I don't want to be tortured. <laughs> that would suck. Yeah. That's but fair. Um, yeah, I think, you know, Jesus' words made me realize that the second coming isn't something to fear, but it's something to wait expectantly on. Mm. And so my question is, you know, what are some of the fears that you need to unlearn and replace with the joy of the truth of his coming? Mm. Yeah, well, it's good. Um, yeah, um, my question is, um, are you being faithful to what you've been called to look after right now? Mm. And is there something you need to change or adjust to, to get into that space, to be more faithful um, and to have an expectant heart for him, yeah. to be keeping watch? Mm. Mm. All right, guys. Well, that brings us to the end of Mark chapter 13. It's a really big chapter, but... We hope that you were able to look at it a new way, just like we were able to look at it a new way. And, you know, if you've enjoyed this podcast, if it's helped you in your journey or your understanding of the Christian life, we just would love to hear your feedback, love to hear some comments, love to hear your reviews, and would love love for you to share this podcast with others that may be um, getting some benefit from that too. But, yeah, we just want to thank you for for joining us and we just pray that you continue to have good morning in moments in your life where you wake up to seeing the world God's way and you start to see things the way that he wants you to see things. So Mm. bye for now. We will see you next week. Thanks, guys.